deserves your best praise. Come on, church. Praise him. Father, we thank you for these worship songs, Lord. We would ask that you would uh, give us faith here tonight. Build faith in your people, Lord. We come in here with doubts and worries and fears, and we need all that to go. Your word says that where your perfect love is, it expels all fear. And so, Lord, we need that more than ever tonight. So we would just pray that you would invade our space tonight, not here just in this room, but invade this space right here, your heart. Invade this space, invade this space right here, your mind, right? Invade those spaces, all those spaces that you want, Lord. You said in your word that you fill the universe with yourself, and we don't want to exclude right now the most important place right here, right here. So we give that place to you right now, Lord, and ask that you would do something with it. We came, we're here, we're expecting, and as I shared this past week, there's never, ever, ever a powerful manifestation of God unless it is preceded by the longing from God's people. And so many of us here are longing for your presence in our life right now, and we would ask that you would come and do a mighty work in us tonight. Advance your kingdom in this place here tonight. If that's what you want, if you want him to advance his kingdom in your place right here, just say amen. Amen. Awesome. All right. Why don't we have a seat real quick? we got lots of work to do, folks. Lots of work to do. So do me a favor and grab a copy of God's Word. They're all over the place. Don't shortchange yourself. Grab a copy. I want to welcome those who may be watching us on Facebook. We're going live right now, so they're from all different places. Um, some of us are here live and not watching from Michigan anymore. That's kind of cool, but uh, welcome back. Uh, but there are others, and I just want, you know what, now, now having mentioned that, I just want to say this, that, 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 that the, okay, I noticed the static, you noticed the static, so here's the thing, you know, we just need some financial blessing in this church, we, I mean, we could, we, I had an electrician in here today, and you can put makeup on a pig all you want, okay, that board is from like 1992, it needs to go. We need like 20 grand to buy new. We have all junk old hand-me-downs. The entire place is filled with it. And we need some financial blessing. So if you would mind just add that maybe to your, your prayer list, I would certainly appreciate it. And listen, just like we just mentioned a few moments ago, we can pray for things. And if we believe that we've received them, they'll be yours. And so just join me. And I've been asking the Lord now for a couple weeks. And I've got a number in mind, and so maybe you can too. But all that to say that this Facebook Live thing that we have, it's not just an evangelistic tool to reach people that are not here, okay? It is a tool and a resource for you. And what I mean by that is last week I preached a message that I got more questions from that message than I've ever received from any message I've ever preached in 15 years, okay? So, so that being said, go back and watch it. Okay, I had people mention that they had asked me about stuff that I had said and they don't remember me saying it in such a highly contested issue. It sh you shouldn't just come in here and listen to someone bark for an hour and go home like that's it. So listen, I just want to encourage you this way. Bring a notebook to church, man. Bring a notebook to church. Let's be different. Be a church that brings their notebook to church so that you can jot down things that are said so that you can go back and check the word of God, okay? Jay's a pastor here. He's been preaching a lot longer than me, and this message drove him into the Bible because he jotted down everything that I said to check and see that it's right. He actually had some points that he brought to my attention that he wasn't, we weren't quite exactly on, on, on line there with each other. And so he, we talked about it. And that's what you're supposed to do. So don't just come to any church, including this one, just assume that I know what I'm talking about. God knows what he's talking about. And, and if I'm, listen, if I'm right, praise God. That doesn't mean I'm always going to be. You have the truth at your, at your disposal right here. So take notes, okay? Go back and check the scriptures. And then go back. You can go onto our Facebook page. You can go onto our YouTube channel. You can go onto our website. And, the, and last week's message, and every message that's ever been preached in this church is right there. So if you want to get clarification, further understanding, you want to learn some more, that's there for you. So please utilize that, okay? 
So last week, I, it was a, a crazy message, and I hope that you uh, learned from that, and I hope that it did drive you to your knees and drive you into God's Word to seek truth. And uh, it was just a continuation of this Sermon on the Mount that Jesus started in Matthew chapter 5. We're going to just go through it verse by verse, section by section. And Jesus is teaching us how to flourish. You know, he said, I came that you might have life and have it in abundance. And he's kind of telling us how to do that, right? You don't just say, okay, Jesus, uh, you're my Lord, and then everything's rocking. Right? Because that doesn't make any sense because he teaches things. And, and so because he's teaching things, we understand that to uh, acquire this this abundant life, you'd have to actually listen to what he has to say and then actually implement that, okay? And so that's what he's been doing. We've been studying that. And so, you know, this week and the next five weeks, it's almost like one sermon, but it's too much to preach in one week, and I wouldn't want to shortchange Jesus in that way. And so what you're going to see here in these next including this six weeks, you're going to see Jesus as he's about to quote six Old Testament laws. That's what he's going to do. And, and, but just before he does this, we're going to start tonight, just before that, you see that he prepares the people on the mountain. And therefore he's preparing us, because we're listening to, by explaining, that was last week's sermon, by explaining that he didn't come to abolish or destroy or end God's law, he came to, I think this is how it's pronounced, play ruo, which is a Greek word that has several meanings, to fully preach the law. And we know that it's not to end the law or to abolish the law because Jesus himself, the one who law it is said until heaven and earth pass away that the law is still there right and we know that this heaven and earth passing away thing is revelation 21 you know god's word builds on itself it started in the garden it ends up in revelation when all these things come to pass and all all the while all between life goes on history so he didn't come to destroy it or abolish it. He prepped the people and us for that. And the question is, why, why did he have to come and explain or clarify the law? The reason is, is because the people who were the rule keepers, the ones who actually did it perfectly, they missed the essence of the law. So why would he have to explain something? If they were rocking it perfect, why would he have to explain anything? Right? That's all he would say is, hey, just keep doing what you're doing. Do what they do. If that was sufficient for salvation, he would just, just do what they do. Right? They're rocking it. If it was sufficient for salvation, why Bethlehem? Why the Incarnation? Why come? And why explain things? And why teach things? And why die? And why resurrect? If keeping the law was good enough for our salvation. Two times in the New Testament, both in Romans and Galatians, I shared this last week, but it's worth mentioning again. It says the same exact thing. Nobody is made right with God by keeping the law. That's what we talked about last week. And some people were kind of confused about that. So this morning, this morning, this evening, I want to clarify first, before we move on in the text, I want to clarify last week. Listen, all attention. No one is made right. I'm just going to summary term that. No one's saved by keeping the law. Okay? No one. No one is made right with God by keeping the laws. I mean, all of them. You can keep every single one. And that's why we saw last week Jesus said that unless your righteousness is, it, it exceeds the righteousness of the ones who keep my law perfectly. So in other words, if your perfection, your performance isn't better than perfect, you can't even get into the kingdom of heaven. Okay, do you understand? So I, I, I don't normally do this in church. Does anyone have a question about what I just said? 
house of love, don't be ashamed. Do you understand? Because this is like super, super important. You can understand the whole Bible. If you don't get this and end up in hell, shame on me. You cannot get saved unless Romans 3.22. We are made right with God by placing our faith. This is going to be a great place for an amen, but hold on. Listen. You are made right with God, not by keeping the law. You are made right with God by placing your faith in Jesus Christ. Hold on, wait for it. No matter who you are. Awesome, right? You start thinking about all the crap you pulled. Yeah, even you. Even you. Anyone who puts their faith in Jesus Christ is made right with God the Father. It's not about keeping the laws. It's about putting your faith in the one who is perfect. Far greater than the ones who were human, just rocking it perfect by keeping the law. Like, that's cool, but that's not good enough. It's kind of tough, tough standard. So, by grace you've been saved, like you didn't earn it. You didn't deserve it. You didn't even want it. Let's be honest. By your actions, you really didn't want it. But by grace, in other words, you didn't deserve any of this, but you got it anyway. So by grace, you've been, fa you've been saved, but that doesn't mean wholesale disregard for God's law. It's not the way it works, even though that's the way it's taught. Okay. Let me just preface all this by saying, I don't have all this figured out. Because there's laws in here that, like, if you take your children to the city gates and stone them, you're going to jail for a long, long time. And so I don't understand all that yet. It's a learning process. We all got to get there and try to make sense of these things. But you don't just disregard the law because Jesus said... Until heaven and earth pass away, the law is still there. It's valid. And, and, and those who ignore the law and teach others to ignore the law, they're going to be the least in the kingdom. So they're still in because they put their faith in Christ. I get that. But they're going to be the least in the kingdom. But those who keep the law and teach others to do so, they'll be the greatest in the kingdom. So both people, both groups, if you keep the law, you're in. If you don't keep the law, you're in. But the ones over here are different than the ones over here. You're all in. Listen, I'm not Jesus by any stretch of the imagination, but Jesus had this awesome way of teaching spiritual truths using practical stuff here on earth that we could kind of wrap our brains around, right? Parables. So I'm not him, but I'm going to do the best that I can to explain what I'm talking about, okay? I don't know about you guys, but... I, you know, I, I, I'm not a very good basketball player, but I did, I did play a little bit when I was younger. You know, Little League stuff. Anyone play Little League? Anyone play high school ball? Anybody? Nobody played high school ball? You played high school ball? Softball, okay. Awesome. You did. So, so I'm, not, I'm not that good of a player, but I do know this, that if you want to make the team... Like, they don't start telling the plays and stuff right away. But if you want to make the team, you've got to come and you have to try out. You've got to just show your basic skill level in order to make the team. Do you guys understand this, right? It's a tryout. It's not exactly knowing all the plays, but it's just, you know, can you dribble? Can you shoot? Can you, can you box out? Can you, you know, whatever. Can you rebound? Can you do all these basic things? Okay, that's what gets you onto the team. That's the prerequisite to get you on the team. And for lack of better terms, the prerequisite to get you onto the heaven team is placing your faith in Jesus Christ. That's your tryout, right? It's not based on what you do. See, well, in basketball, it's based on what I do. You know, if I can fill it up, then I'm in. But in heaven, it's not based on what you can do. The prerequisite to make the team is placing your faith in Jesus Christ. But here's the deal. Once you make the team, you want to play, do you want to play? <laughs> or do you want to sit on the bench? That's the point. Like, who wants to be a bench warmer? Who wants to be JV when you want to play? Listen, all the girls like the guys on varsity, man. They don't want to, they don't want to date some 
some scrub on JV who's, who's a bench warmer. So the question is, is, is do you want to play or do you want to ride the pine? And that's kind of what Jesus is talking about here. He says, you're in if you accept me. You're on the team, but you're going to be great. You're going to be, you're going to be a starter. You're going to be a star in my kingdom if you'll keep my commands and teach others to do so. Or you can ride the pine, play the bench. Maybe you'll get in once in a while, but... Get it? Clear? Okay, awesome. So that being said, I, I kind of want to jump into this teaching. I want to jump into Jesus talking about these six commandments that are found in like Deuteronomy and Exodus and stuff. You can look them up. But before we jump into Matthew 5, 21 through 26, which is where you should turn your Bible, I want to lay some foundation for you because you don't just rip open the Bible and start reading it. You've got to know what you're reading. And Jesus is about to quote some Old Testament law. And to get a full understanding of what he's talking about, I want to take you all the way back to Genesis chapter 1. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, 27, preceding that, you see God creating everything. And right at the very end of his creation, virtually there at the end, it says this. In verse 26, then God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. They'll reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals on the earth, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. What he's saying there is, like, listen to him. Let us make God in our image. And then what does he say? They're going to actually rule here. Like, that's what God does, right? Like, we're not God. Say, I'm not God. Okay, awesome. We know that there's a God, but you ain't him, and I'm not him. But he said, in his image. So we're going to be kind of like that. God rules over everything, and he's made us to be like him, to rule over everything. It's just a picture of what he does. We're like him. Verse 27. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Okay? What we see here in this text is what the Jewish folks would call the Selem Elohim. And in Latin, it's the Imago Dei. This is the idea of created in God's image. Okay? You were created in God's image. Nothing in all the universe can say that. You were created in God's image image. That has a lot of ramifications. We could talk about that for days and days. But here's one thing you absolutely have to know because of this, you have inherent value. You have value. Listen, it's what you were born with. At the moment of your birth, which is Christian position, conception. Someone say amen. Okay. At the moment of conception, this happened. You had value because God put it in you. And it's permanent. It's not based on like everything else in this world that we're subject to in our world. It's not based on your performance. And listen, it's permanent. It can't be taken away. It can't be added to. It can't be subtracted from. It can't be stolen by somebody else. No one's cutting you in line. You have value because God put it there. It's not based on what you do. It's not based on how you look. You, man, you could, you could be a, like a supermodel, and you could just be ugly, and it don't matter. It doesn't have any bearing on this value. You could, you could, um, you could be running a Fortune 500 company, or you could be sleeping on a park bench. Don't matter. It's not subject to the culture that you live in because we all live in different, different countries and all this stuff, right? And different value systems and different nations. And it doesn't matter because he's talking about everybody. So it doesn't matter what the culture says. Like you could, like in our culture, the, the elderly are kind of put out to pasture. Their good years are behind them and go to the villages and play golf and drink and retire and 
We don't need you anymore, and I know that you ran a Fortune 500 company, and you pastored a church, and you did all these great things, and have all this wisdom and experience, but we don't care about you anymore because you're past 60. Like, that's stupid, but that's the world we live in here in this country. And so we have cultural standards, but listen, it doesn't matter if you're in a wheelchair or you're in the Olympics. It doesn't make any difference if you're blind, if you're deaf, which our culture just kind of over here, right? Because the rest of us normal people are rocking it. You're just, you know. It doesn't make any difference if you're rich or poor or in jail for a long, 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 long time, whether you're black or white or young or old, or you live in Beverly Hills, or you live in a cave, you have value and you have worth. Whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, you actually have worth to God. The imprint of Almighty God upon you makes you valuable to God himself. And this is most evident in his willingness to die for whosoever, right? For God so loved the world. You guys know this one, right? John 3, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son to whosoever, anyone. You, 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 anyone, anyone. I died for every single person. Beca why? Because you have value. It's not just reserved just for Tom. It's not just reserved just for Paula. It's for whosoever. He died for all people because everyone has value. And then this God, out of this love, you see that he has got great love for all people. You have value and worth. And so he gives out of this love his people, his most precious creation. He gives them some commands, some law to be obeyed for sure and also to bless us with good lives and good relationships with one another in, listen, in the obeying. You get this? In the process of obeying his commands, you will find blessing in your life and blessing in relationship with one another if you keep them. And here's how I absolutely can claim that all of his commands are for your good. Every single one. You ready? In Matthew 22, 36 through 40 is what we call the great commandment. Right? You guys familiar with this? Okay. You say, what's the most important commandment? I mean, we've got all these rules. I don't really want to keep them all, God. It's too tough. So what's the most important? Give me the crib notes. Just let me get these things down. And if I get these things down, I'll be good. And Jesus is like, okay, I got you. I got you. Here, here's what they are. Uh, love the Lord God with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength. And the second is like the first, love your neighbor as yourself. So what is this? We got vertical love, right? And then what? Horizontal love. Doesn't stop there, though. Here's the part that matters. All the law and the prophets hang on these two things. All of the law, it says it. Jesus said it. I didn't. Take it up with him. All the law hangs upon or is based on these two commands. I think it's interesting. We're going to talk about it later. He said, what's the greatest command? And he said, the greatest command is this. That's kind of peculiar. Is Jesus wrong? He said, no, he's not. The greatest command, singular, is plural. These two things. And all of the law hangs, is based on these two commands. So what does this say? What is Jesus saying to us? He's saying that keeping God's commands, all of them, are supposed to help your heart and mind to stir up love and affection for God and for his people. All, it says, all of the commands are hanging on these two things. So all of the commands are supposed to drive your heart towards loving God more and loving people more. Do you see it in the text? You, you read it, right? That's what his commands are for. 
But too often, in their case, these Pharisees and scribes, the one who kept the law perfectly. They're just going through the motions. And they were mi- this is why Jesus had to come say these things, because they were missing the essence. They were missing the motivation. They were missing, this is it right here, right? The why of the command. They were doing the command, but they missed the why of the command. So, do you ever tell your kids after they did something wrong, go tell him you're sorry? Do you ever do that? What do they do? Sorry. Okay. Did he keep the command? What got accomplished? Nothing. Right? Maybe, maybe, maybe though, maybe training towards a heart change, training the child to recognize their fault and their willingness to say, I'm sorry, right? Tra- like, did it, did it seem like they accomplished anything there? No, no, no. They, they, didn't, they didn't seem to get the essence of the command to go say, I'm sorry, and repent. They didn't get it. Nothing was sinking in. They missed the essence of the command from mom and dad, but they still did it, right? And that's what people do. They do, that we're do-gooders. I want to do the right thing, right? So I try to do it, but I miss the why. And that's the idea of pleruo, fully preach the law. So you could, because they were already keeping it perfect. So it wasn't a matter of trying to teach them to keep it better. It was trying to teach them to understand why this is, why do I have these commands? And, and they're to help you to love the Lord God with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength, and love people the same. That's what the laws were for. So in our text this evening, in Matthew 5, 21 through 26, God, Jesus, he speaks with tang- about tangible things. He talks about, about death and judgment and hell and sacrifices and judges and officers and prisons, all these things that are real. You can see them, touch them, feel them, right? That's not what he's even talking about. You're going to see in the text he is tenaciously going after your heart. That's what he's doing here. And people miss the essence of God's law. So that being said, why don't we uh, go ahead and read that? You all there? Twenty, verse twenty-one. Everyone, awesome. Okay, I'm reading out of the NLT. It's not the greatest in this translate in this section, but I may reference some other verse, some other translations. If you have another translation, feel free. You have heard that our ancestors were told. He's referring back to. These commandments, and you can see if you look in your Bible, there'll be a star there, and it'll reference you back to the Old Testament where God gave the command, okay? That's what Jesus is saying here. You have heard that our ancestors were told you must not murder. If you commit murder, you are subject to judgment. But I say if you are even angry with someone, you are subject to judgment. If you call someone an idiot... You're in danger of being brought before the court. And if you curse someone, I think in most translations it's like call him a moron or a fool or something like this, right? If you have other translations. What does your Bible say? Fool. Anyone else? Raka. Okay. If you curse someone, you're in danger of the fires of hell. So if if you are presenting a sacrifice at the altar in the temple, and you suddenly remember that someone has something against you, leave your sacrifice there at the altar, go and be reconciled to that person, then come and offer your sacrifice to God. When you're on your way to court with your adversary, settle your differences quickly, otherwise your accuser may hand you over to the judge, who will hand you over to an officer, and you'll be thrown into prison. 
And if that happens, you surely won't be free again until you have paid the last penny. Okay. This is super sensitive ground. And I'm going to ask you for the privilege to walk where angels fear to tread. Especially in the south. What I'm asking you to do is for somehow, some way, to take all of your feelings and lay them down on the chair next to you. Okay? You, you, listen, to accomplish anything, you've got to do this. Okay? Because it doesn't matter what we feel. Today I was at my house. We were doing a garage sale to evangelize the community. You know, you guys heard about this with Meredith, right? So I'm sitting there, in my, standing there in my driveway, and there's this young man who has a white convertible BMW, and he constantly comes flying down the road. I've never seen it. My wife's been telling me. He flies down the road, and he gets, like, almost on two wheels, blows through stop signs right at my corner, and comes right in front of our house and goes out to the entrance. I mean flying. And honest, I screamed at him. And I, what I really want to do is like reach for a wrench and whip it, right, and just hum it right at his car. That's really what I wanted to do. And would anyone in this room blame me for that? I got Jackson and Jameson in my driveway, right? Would you blame me for wanting to do that? But is it right? It's not. It's not right. That's not what we're supposed to do, right? So I understand how you feel when I'm about to talk about some things. And I understand because I feel the same exact way. I have my own feelings, my own passions, my own desires, my own culture that I was brought up in. I've been taught some things, and what I'm asking you to do, and this is why I tell you to re-watch sermons and bring notebooks so you can test it against the Word of God, okay? So I'm going to talk about some tender things here, all right? First thing I want to talk about here is this commandment of you must not murder, okay? You must not murder. The Hebrew word for that is, it's thou shalt not rasach, okay? Thou shalt not, you guys all make fun of us Jewish people because we have that right? Okay, rasach. Here's what it means. It means to dash in pieces. You can imagine what that would look like. Use your imagination. Comma, to kill a human being, parentheses, especially murder. Okay. If you look up that word in the Strong's Concordance, in the ancient of ancients, like this is what the word that was used means. Okay. It doesn't matter what you think it means. It doesn't matter what I think it means. God's word says, thou shalt not rasach, which is to dash into pieces, to kill a human being, especially to murder. Now, I was always taught that kill is okay. Like, every time I've ever talked to someone about this thing, because I've always had this angst inside of me. I had my own feeling about this. It wasn't grounded in any theology. I just had this feeling about this commandment. And I've, every time I've engaged with someone about it, they said, no, 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 no. The Bible says thou shalt not murder, that killing is okay, but murder is not. Justified killing isn't murder, so therefore it isn't wrong. Now, just listen. Put your feelings aside, and just think about this. I don't know how many nations there are in the world. Someone could probably Google that and figure it out later on. But every single nation has its own set of laws and standards. Do you know this, right? And in every single nation, and, and then in a nation like ours, we have 50 states, and we have our own set of standards and laws, too. And each one of these nations and states and time periods, we are all deciding what justified killing is. And so who is God in that equation? Raise your hand. Us. Because we're deciding... You know, some places say if a person does this, you're justified in doing this. 
In this country, it might not be that. In this country, we have a different standard as to what. Someone comes into my house, I can shoot him. And someone comes into my house in this country, maybe you can't. Like, it's subjective. It's everyone, right? Everyone decides. So who's, so what happened to God's law that said don't kill a human? Well, it got waived because we decide that it's okay to kill this one. We need to stop twisting God's commands to fit our desires and start letting our desires be framed by God's commands. Okay? That's what we need to do. But we don't. I'm not ripping you guys because I do the same thing. I'm, I'm right there with you. I, I, I don't follow all this stuff either. I, I, cause I, like I said, I got my own taste and they're different than yours and my own preference and my own style and my own background and my own, and I don't, Right? We don't all keep the sa- this the same way, do we? Even in this room with just this pe- with, with 50 people, we don't all keep it the same exact way, and I get all that. But can we just, uh, here's the revolution. Can we all just commit afresh to, to desiring at least to let our framework be shaped by God's word and, and let, instead of trying to create God in our own image, can we do that? I want to do that. I want to be that church. So, the command of God to America, to Canada, to Uganda, to China, to Japan, to keep going, thou shalt not kill a human being. And let us not seek the innuendo and the the secret, mysterious things of the word to try to prove our point to the dismissal of what is clearly written, right? So we could, well, it's, it, it, in the Bible he says that he killed, listen, Solomon had 800 wives. Does that mean it's biblical and we should do it? Right? Just, just, listen, just because we're looking for a Bible name, you have a sweet little daughter, you're going to call her Jezebel because it's in the Bible? Of course not, right? So just because it says that someone in the Bible killed someone, that doesn't mean it's okay. Not everyone in the Bible did everything right all the time. But God is right, and God said, Thou shalt not kill a human being. That's what it says. So we need to stop making rules and, and, and try to circumvent and... It's clear, right? Thou shalt not kill a human being. And I love the Hebrew definition here, too, this rasach. It says, and some people took, you know, translators took liberties and chose the murder. Okay? But that's not the definition. It's included in that. I get it. Especially, it's in parentheses, especially murder. But not not isolated to only murder, right? It's thou shalt not kill, especially murder. Murder being premeditated, sought out, planned killing of the Imago Dei. That's what murder is, right? Instead of thinking these things out, and I want to think this out, and I want to plan on, because he's a jerk, and she deserves it, and you don't know what... Listen, thinking about another person shouldn't stir up hatred and murder. It should stir up the reality of the Imago Dei that I can't do this because they are made in God's image. And he said, I can't do that. Thou shalt not kill. That's what it says. And your value and my value and Every person's value is so high to God that if you play God and take another human's life, look back at the text, you're subject to bad translation. Bad translation. This one says you're subject to judgment. Go to a Holman Christian Standard. Go to a ESV. Go to a New American Standard. Go to a King James, New King James. They don't say you're subject to judgment. They say you're subject to the judgment. The judgment, right? 
Kind of like, you know, that famous verse that everybody likes to quote because they want to do whatever they want. Don't judge lest you be judged. Because the same way you judge, that same judgment's going to come back on you, right? But you know what's really weird about that verse? It never really says whether that judgment coming back is what other people will judge you or whether it's God's going to judge you that way. It just doesn't say it. So let's just, let's just do some work together. How many people in the room honestly give a rip about what other people think? If you're living for Christ the best you know how, do you really care what other people think? Do you? No, you don't, right? But if you're living in a way that's not, ha that's not making God happy, do you care? You all do, right? So even though the verse in, about judgment doesn't specifically say, if you judge others, then God's going to judge you. It doesn't say that. But we default to that because that's what really matters. Just in case that's what the verse means, we're going to just assume that's what it is, and then we're not going to judge. We don't care what other people do to us. Who gives a rip what you guys think? Right? But if God thinks I'm doing something wrong, he's going to judge me. Then, whoa, i got to address what I'm doing here. I better start judging right. But in this text, it says, if you play God and kill another human being, you are subject to the judgment. Now, I don't even know if that means the judgment's like heaven and hell thing. I just know that that's what it says. And that should put a little bit of this in you. You understand? If you, if you break the rule that says thou shalt not kill, you are subject, not to any courtroom, you're subject to the courtroom. Now I'm just telling you what the Bible says, and you've got to do what you want with it. But I think you can see, because of this, you can see the value of every person, right? Do you see it there, right? You can see the value that God has put inside every single human on earth that he says that if you mistreat that person by taking that person's life, you're subject to the judgment, y'all. Like you can see the value of each person in that. Murder is illegal killing, right? Don't we all agree with that? Murder is illegal killing. But forget the laws of the nation. The law that supersedes that is the, God, is the law of God, and God said, don't kill a human. So when you kill them, that's murder. Forget the United States government rules. What about God's law? It's okay to break that? No. He said, don't kill another human. Done. This is not a political stance I have for you. Everyone's fighting over Republican and Democrat right now. Who won? Who won? Who won? I got my opinion. You want it? You ask me. But I don't care what your opinion is. You can have your own opinion. It doesn't matter. I'm just telling, I'm telling you this rule. This. It's the most important thing. 1 John 3.15 says, Murderers do not have eternal life in them. You see why now I'm saying it's not just judgment, like what other people are going to think, or may be subject to kind of, sort of. No, 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 no. Murderers do not have eternal life in them. That's the judgment. Do you see? Okay? That's the judgment. Is there hope? Is there help? Yeah, absolutely. First John 1 John 1.9 should be everyone's favorite verse in all of Scripture, because we're all mess-ups. If you are if you will confess your sin to Jesus, he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sin and to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. So you have this hope, but if you hold on to that thing and you don't repent and you don't confess your sin and be forgiven by Jesus, there's no eternal life in you. So just say this to the person who's in their seat right now going, well, what about all those people in the Bible that killed all those people? And God told them, listen, I'm going to go out on a limb. If, if the angel of the Lord comes into your room and tells you to kill someone, go for it, dude. Don't blame me. I didn't give you the permission. I'm just telling you, if that happens, like it did in the Old Testament when God said, Saul, 
See those people over there? They're not worshiping me. They're rotten, terrible. They're, 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 they're awful. I want you to wipe them all out. Okay. God told them to do that because every person is God's. The earth is God's. The universe is God's. And if he wants you dead, that's up to him. Not up to me. And so when, 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 when nasty people do nasty things to us and we say, well, I'm going to get them back. I'm going to step where angels fear to tread. When terrorists come to us and do unmentionable things. Should we kill them? Did God whisper in your ear, president, whoever, go kill them? I never heard Mr. Bush say that. What I heard is what everybody wanted to hear. Pardon me, you don't piss in our cornflakes. We're coming to get you. And we'll make you a parking lot. Not cool. Not cool. Not cool. Thou shalt not kill a human being. Whether his politics are different than yours, whether his ethnicity is different than yours, whether his standards are different than yours, whether his communism, democracy, whatever. He wronged me. She cheated me. Don't kill a human being. Jesus is totally seeking heart change in people. And he is repeatedly elevating the value of each person here. In what we read, first he says, don't kill him. And then he says, don't even speak ill of anyone. Is that a heart thing or is that a physical thing? It's right here, right? What's he going after? If I go up to, to Tom and I say, you stupid fool. Sticks and stones, right? He don't give a rip. So what is he going after here? He's going after my heart. Because he wants me, remember all the commands, what do they, they hang on what? The great commandment. Love God, love people. That's why, that's why he's saying don't kill them, don't speak ill of them, because he wants me to love him and love Tom. That's what this don't kill is all about. It's not about killing. If, if someone killed me right now, would it even matter? Not really. In 100 years, they wouldn't even remember who I was. But what he wants to do is he wants all people to love him with all their mind, heart, soul, and strength, and then love people. He doesn't even want us to speak ill of anyone, and if you do, the degree of punishment speaks to the value of each human and promotes a heart change that should result in great relationships between people. Look up here. You're valuable. You're valuable. Every single person in here is valuable. Anyone who's listening online is valuable. And we should treat each other in such a way. That means we make time for one another. We listen. We're inconvenienced. It's okay. Because if you're that valuable, then I should be willing to give you a moment of my day. And I have to learn. This is, I'm preaching to myself. Because when you're in a position and there's a lot of people, they want time, and I have my own agenda of things I need to do, and I don't like when you interfere with that. Am I alone? We all don't like that, right? I don't like it when I'm back doing something or something, and I'm like studying with my headphones on, and they come over and tap me on the shoulder. Really? But you're valuable. So it's okay for me to just, okay, I got it. God's kingdom will go on if I, don't, if I break study for three minutes. Let's just talk to this person. We should all be doing that. I would just say that kindness promotes a better relationship with others and recognized value expressed in words and actions promotes good relationships. So now let's watch as Jesus turns up human value here in the text. Not only are you in danger of hell judgment if you don't love others well, right? That's the horizontal thing. Like you're in, you're in jeopardy of hell judgment if we don't love one another and appreciate each other's value. But watch the vertical element here in the text, okay? It's easy 
to love God. He's invisible. And he's reliable. And he always comes through. Later than sooner. Can I get an amen? Kind of discouraging right there. I'm going to say it. On your behalf. <laughs> but it's easy to love him. Right? Love the Lord God with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength. Check. Love your neighbor as yourself. Mm. Mm. Not so checked. Right? Not so checked. People, they let you down. You let them down. Mm. Read 23, right here, verse 23. You there again? You see it? So if you're present, so he, he says, hey, listen, treat each other well. Let's just summarize the prior uh, paragraph and just say, treat each other well. Don't kill each other. Don't, don't say nasty things about one another. You all have value and worth, so I'm going to treat you well. And so if you're present, so here's the practical. So maybe you haven't treated somebody well, and, and it's really not good. You've got a bad thing going with somebody. He says, so if you're presenting a sacrifice at the altar in the temple and you suddenly remember that someone has something against you. And I'll just stop there for a second. So this isn't writing to you saying, hey, if someone did you wrong, that's not what's being said there, right? What's being said is if, something ha if someone has something against you, does that mean you did something wrong? Maybe not. Maybe it's perceived. Maybe you, maybe you did something you thought was awesome. I, I was taught that even if you say the right thing in the wrong way, you lose. Right? So maybe, maybe, maybe you, you, were, you were rocking it, being a great friend, and you thought you were doing right, but it was perceived wrong, and you hurt another brother's feelings or another sister's feelings, and they're hurt, and because of that, the relationship that God is, all of his commands are hanging on, loving everybody, right? It's been strained. And, and all of a sudden, you go to the, to the church, and you've got, listen, you, 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 you're feeling generous, and, and, and the sound system needs work, and so, you know, I'm going to bring my, listen, I'm going to bring $1,000 to the church. Great. Except Jesus says, yeah, before you put that in the basket, okay, leave it on the ground. I don't want it. Because uh, Ken, you and Casper, have, you, you ticked him off. You didn't mean it. You thought you were doing right. And he's upset. So uh, keep your thousand bucks and go help. Go make that better. You see, the ver so you see the vertical thing? Before, before you go here, I need you to go here. Listen, this is, this is what I wrote down. Before you, listen, you need to go extend your hand to a brother before you extend your hands to God. Okay? That's what he says. He says, if you, if, before, you, before you come and extend your hands in worship, you want to come to church and, and sing to him and bring your thousand dollars because I want to help out and I want to serve and I want to, before you get to dancing and singing in the aisles for Jesus, um, if your brother has something against you, go make it right before you come do that. That you, he's saying, you listen, you, you, you can't experience this vertical thing with me without the horizontal thing being right. And you certainly can't experience this thing with each other until you get this right. Hand in hand. That's why he said, what's the greatest commandment? The greatest commandment is two commandments. Because you can't have one without the other. You can't have a great connection with God. It's, oh, I love Jesus, but I hate his people. I love Meredith, but I hate Moses. I love Moses, but I can't stand Meredith. Uh-uh, not happening. You can't have a great relationship with people and not have a great relationship with the Lord. It's empty and shallow and weak. It goes both ways. So he explains a lot about this do not kill stuff, right? But where in there does he say, well, you've heard it said, but I say, where does it say that do not kill is still not valid? Did he ever negate it? Did he ever say that doesn't count anymore? 
Where in there does it say that? Maybe your translation. Who has a different translation? That can tell me that it says that you don't have to abide by that command anymore because you're under grace. Who, anyone have that translation? I didn't think so. So here's where we'll finish. Okay? Thou shalt not kill fully preached is the why of do not kill. Fully preached, the commandment of thou shalt not kill, fully preached as Jesus just has done, is the why behind the not to kill. Because each of us is made in the image of God, we have enormous value to God, and therefore we should have enormous value to one another. Jesus said, if you love me, you keep my commands, right? If you love me, you keep my commands. So loving God with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength is in the obeying of his commands. That's what he said, not what I said. You can make up your own program of how you're going to love God, but Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commands. That's what loving the Lord God with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength looks like. But the why is realizing the high value in each person and striving to be in right relationship with them. That's loving your neighbor. And listen, all the law, all the law, all the law, is based on those two commands. All of it. Jesus didn't come so you wouldn't keep his commands. He came and he explained them so that you would. Do you understand? Have we achieved clarity? Awesome. Can we pray together? Let's pray. We need to pray. We need to pray. We need to pray. So, Lord, your word has been proclaimed. And to the best of my ability, although not the most talented of orators, I've tried to not only proclaim it, but I've done my best to explain it. But now it's up to you to help your people retain it. So we need your help, Lord. All of us that have bent the knee to Jesus Christ have the mind of Christ in us. And we have the spirit of Christ dwelling in us. And we have 66 beautiful, perfect, clear books of explanation and so we would just pray Lord that you would lead us into all truth that's what the Holy Spirit of God does he leads us into all truth so Lord take what we've done here tonight and lead your people into truth so that we could obey your great commandment of loving you with all our mind, heart, soul, and strength and loving our neighbor as ourselves. All of your commands hang on those two. And in the obeying, your desire is that our affection for you and one another would be stirred afresh. So help us to put down our style and our preference and our feeling and pick up your truth and begin to live it out. I would just share this in our prayer. Heads are still bowed. And maybe you can catch the vision with me. I don't know if it's going to happen in my lifetime or not loved ones, but 
what would it be like, what would God do, this almighty one who spoke the planets into existence? What would this God almighty do if his church put aside their preference and feeling and began to obey what he said? And instead of engaging our own strengths and our own creativity, we would engage his. How awesome would it be? That's what we want, Lord.